So if any of you have questions, there, is there a mic now? Do you want to come up to this microphone? It's supposed to be working. There we go. And we have about 10 it minutes. It is working. For and, and I have a question for Dr. Cole. Um, about five years ago, I read James Lifton's Biology of Belief. Um, and so my memory is not completely clear, but basically he said you can change your DNA with your belief systems. Can, do you know that work, and can you comment on that? Well, uh, I would say the general consensus is to a first approximation, you can't change literally your DNA sequence uh, with this, but uh, it turns out that our DNA sequence probably looms larger in the minds of scientists than it does in the biology of life. So what really matters isn't the DNA that's there, or another way to put it, certainly what, what matters the most is not whether the DNA is there in the first place in general, as long as we're born and thrive and survive. Um, but so much uh, how it's expressed, when it's expressed. So if you look at all 22,000 genes in the, in the context of any given cell, you find that only a minority of them are actively expressed. So there's a lot of decision making going on where essentially life and the environment are uh, voting uh, essentially about whether this gene should be expressed in this cell at this particular point in time. And that certainly is very um, subject to modulation. That's kind of what I was talking about and implicit in really what many of us were speaking about today. So while you can't change typically your DNA, uh, you, you certainly can change the extent to which it's actually realized in the form of RNA and protein and, and changes in the biology of cells. Uh, and there's a number of different levels at which we now understand that. I think there was much discussion of epigenetics earlier or the sort of these proximal modifications of the DNA that might sort of wrap it up or, or code it in a way that prevents it from being actively expressed. There's the story about transcription factors that I alluded to, which is much more connected with the outside world and receptors on the surface of cells and that kind of thing. Um, so that would be the first approximation answer. Now, that said, uh, there is a DNA maintenance effort underway in the cell, and um, as cells proliferate, there is an accumulation of DNA damage as well. So if you lead a life that does cause your cells to proliferate a lot, actually you will be accumulating mutations at a somewhat higher stochastic rate than you would be um, in a sort of less proliferation-inducing lifestyle or something like that. So to the extent that that literally is the modification of DNA, technically speaking, that could well be true. I have two questions. Um, one is research I'd like stand, to see. Stand up, please. One is research that I'd like to see, and perhaps it's been done and you can let us know what was found, but basically it would be uh, the subjects are, their oxytocin levels are measured before and after. Uh, they have an opportunity to perform an act of compassion. There's no compassion training. They simply have an opportunity to perform it how they perform that act of compassion is rated on a scale from, say, zero to five. So the questions that that would answer is, are naturally compassionate people, do they have higher levels of oxytocin naturally? And does performing an act of compassion raise oxytocin levels? And is that a function of the level of compassion they exhibited in their response? So that's question number one. Remember that one. And then the second... <laughs> we probably want that one question because there's a long line. Well, very the second one's minutes. really quick. And it may the answers not, to these usually are not. It, it may or may not be re related. Uh, when I was a graduate student running rats in mazes, if a rat learned a maze and you gave them oxytocin, they forgot what they learned and could no longer run the maze. So oxytocin was demonstrated as a memory inhibitor. So I remembered that research years later when I was pregnant, and the closer I got to delivering, the less I could find my car keys. And that I continued to misplace my car keys all through breastfeeding. When I stopped breastfeeding, all of a sudden I could remember where I put my car keys. So I remember thinking, hmm, oxytocin, memory inhibitor. So my question is, is what could the role of memory be playing in compassion? For example, is it easier to be compassionate compassionate, forgive and forget what people have done to you if you can't remember what they did to you. <laughs> and, and we're, that, we're, that, that would be fine. That's fine. Okay. okay, who's that question for? 
So any of you can take that question. I could touch on the first one, and um, quick answer is we're on it. Um, we're basically with our moral elevation paradigm. Sue Carter kindly trained us how to measure salivary oxytocin, and so we're really interested to see how these naturally occurring oxytocin fluctuations uh, relate to individual differences in compassionate profiles. Well, talk about the I think memory. Stephanie has, is Stephanie still here, Stephanie Brown. Don't you have a little, you have an approximation of that in your study too. Yeah. Is the memory, the memory The question? memory piece has turned out to be very interesting. So it was long thought that oxytocin was an amnesic, but I think it's only an amnesic under certain conditions. And actually what it may do instead is focus on things like baby and and change the the breadth of focus for irrelevant, otherwise irrelevant. It's an encoding standard. modulator. Maybe. That's right. That's right. And, and I would add to that too that that in some senses we know that oxytocin actually enhances certain kinds of memory, especially as it pertains to faces and social memory. And in fact, in a recent Nature publication in 2010, it was shown that when they depleted the amygdala of oxytocin in murine models, they were unable to recognize animals that they had just seen. Um, so we know that, that it, there's probably selective memory m uh, modulation um, that, that probably codes along social dimensions. We don't even know what memory is, so that, that kind of gets <laughs> Next question. Okay. So first of all, thank you all for just an amazing set of presentations. It was just beautiful and, and rich, and I'll digest it for a long time. Fidaus, am I saying your name right? Yeah. Fidaus, yeah. Fidaus, well, no, I'm not, but okay, I will learn. <laughs> Um, I, was, I, I will ask you my question for you and leave the other ones for later. Um, about this good stress thing and the, how this, uh, you know, up, going up, you know, the um, increase in the stress response is actually beneficial for procedures, et cetera, um, surgery and, and vaccination. Does this mean that those of us who train people to be more relaxed when facing medical procedures are actually doing them a disservice. <laughs> so, wow. so you know that's a good question, and and what we find is that anything that one does to reduce the chronic stress levels, okay, increases sort of the health potential by increasing the existence of the individual in the green zone in the equilibrium, and it enhances the robustness of the protective fight or flight response. Now, if you were to really train someone to completely eliminate their fight or flight stress response during vaccination or surgery, then that might remove their ability to benefit from what nature has designed for them. Um, and I think there is a paper that sh has shown that a very successful anxiolytic treatment before surgery actually results in worse outcome. And okay, but there's just they one. Give people, um anti-anxiety medication to calm them down yes. before they go in. And that could be problematic as well. It could be problematic if it really knocks out that acute response around the time of the procedure. But again, anything that you do, in fact, I've been talking to some of my colleagues about uh, finding out ways to, in a more midterm way, reduce you know, chronic stress levels. Anything that you can do to reduce those chronic stress levels and enhance sleep, enhance quality of sleep, is almost certainly likely to benefit not only that acute stress response, but that biological outcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I have a question for Dr. Carter and Dr. Rodriguez. So Dr. Rodriguez, you mentioned that uh, it can be potentially dangerous to artificially induce oxytocin. And Joel, you also mentioned that you know um, the translation from these chemicals onto behaviors and emotions uh, is not as, uh, not as simple. It can come with unintended uh, side effects. So. Um, but let's just say that researchers have figured it all out and <laughs> it's like perfectly safe to artificially administer it. So with that assumption, um, I would like to hear what you think about the possibility of using oxytocin in therapeutic settings, for example, like in couple settings, I mean, sorry, couples therapy. So just like as a depressed person may take antidepressant to relieve pain, do you think that couples that are going through difficult times, and let's just say they tried everything and never worked, uh, do you think they can also use oxytocin to increase mutual empathy, love, and trust? Go ahead. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question. 
I would caution against using oxytocin administration for a couples therapy per se, because if there are so many ways to get oxytocin naturally, and if it's just not working, I don't know if it's a great way to kind of suck your love over the head and to really um, induce this oxytocin. As far as therapeutic mechanisms, oxytocin is being used now for autistic population, and it does increase social engagement and eye contact as well. So it's conceivable once we figure it all out for really uh, rare cases that can be used as a therapeutic mechanism. I think optogenetics is a feature of marriage therapy. <laughs> optogenetics. I think elevation is. Well, there's a lady at the University of North Carolina giving oxytocin intranasally to children, and she's getting all kinds of adverse effects. So if this is going on the internet or wherever this information is going, please, whoever's listening to it, take this very careful and, and don't you know, don't jump into it. It does not take long on the internet to determine that gene therapy can come with some substantial, just, you know, sort of delivery-based side effects. Uh, but let's imagine that we could get rid of that bit where you get killed by the therapy in the first place, <laughs> or it causes you leukemia, or any, like, you know, sort of brain cancer, or any of the other things that have happened with this. Let's say we took care of all of that, and we adjusted one of these genes. Um, if we really understood fairly well how all 22,000 human genes work, and that's at the, you know, 2 to the 22,000th power network at the very least because these things all interact with one another, um, then, you know, we might really consider it. And in cases where there's, you know, a huge uh, ethical asymmetry, we might consider it. But just messing with normal, healthy individuals, as, you know, she was just pointing out, um, the risk, frankly, loom much larger than, than the benefits uh, and that's particularly true because of the structure of the way our genomes work. So there's very few genes, it turns out, that make a really substantial difference in human behavior, at least genes in humans that haven't already died in utero or something like that. There are some really lethal gene mutations. They tend to end up in people that just don't end up being born. But once you get born, after that, you're pretty, pretty you know, well taking... Uh, a huge asymmetric risk by messing with these systems unless you've got them completely well mapped and unless there's a substantial upside. So at this point, they're, they're, because there's so few genes that have the substantial upside, there's so much risk in terms of actually manipulating them and there's so much uncertainty in terms of how they interact with the rest of their, both their local environment, their, their fellow genes, and the world outside them, either at the biochemical level of the cell or the entirety of human life. I think. I personally, obviously, would be, you know, sort of pretty reluctant to go messing around with that. <laughs> Next, Brian. I also wanted to thank the committee for a remarkably nuanced and progressive set of talks. I'm sure we'll see many exciting developments along these lines in years to come. I wanted to bug Cole, though, uh, partially because he's my friend and partially because I want to defend hedonists in the crowd. Um, so uh, <laughs> there is a set of findings, which you are aware of, uh, that suggests that positive emotion of the, the typical positive arousal variety, uh, like from Sheldon Cohen's lab, can offset um, the, the danger of getting a cold, for instance. Or Judy Moskowitz has data also, and Alyssa Apple, that you're aware of, that suggests there are some beneficial health effects of positive uh, emotion. And so I'm wondering, how, you, how do you think of your findings, of this, especially this hedonistic arrow going down, in light of those uh, other findings in the literature? Yeah, that's a great question. So. I, first, it's important to note that eudaimonic and hedonic well-being are, in sort of the free-range world, actually pretty highly correlated. My recollection is they're correlated about 0.8 or something like that. Um, and that may just be because of, you know, sort of individual differences in, you know, sort of genetics of affective systems or something like that. But um, to a first approximation, they're, they, they are pretty tightly correlated. So in the world of... Judy Moskowitz or Sheldon Cohen or any of the other sort of positive psychology and health studies, um, I think it would be actually very hard to split these things apart. Um, in fact, as far as I'm aware, there's relatively few times when people had the instrumentation available to actually say, um, sort of split the hair and say, okay, what I'm going to really do here is look at people who are substantially more hedonic than eudaimonic. You can think of it as being sort of out of balance in one direction or another, or substantially more eudaimonic than hedonic. And that's actually where we saw that gene expression dynamic snap out the most crisply. Uh, if you just look at these two, you know, almost collinear predictors, uh, in sort of uh, one at a time, 
they both actually look like they're pretty good. It's really not until you look at the version of hedonic well-being that considerably exceeds uh, your eudaimonic well-being that you start to see this really more risky kind of transcriptional correlate. Um, and we're pretty sure that this doesn't just have to do with people smoking and drinking and partying and you know sort of knocking their heads on the ground or whatever. Um, because we one because we can kind of control for that, uh, but also because we can we can kind of um, look at the molecular level at what those adverse kinds of behavioral correlates of of you know this this uh, well-being asymmetry would add up to, and we, we didn't see much evidence that that was. Could I ask follow up on that with one question for Steve? Do I you, thought you were supposed to be answering for me. No, <laughs> no way. How about sex differences? Um, good question. I'm not sure that we've looked deeply enough at that to have any kind of even first pass conjecture. Um, we rarely see sex differences in how uh, sort of genome biology, if you will, plays out relative to people's psychology. Um, but what we do see big sex differences in is how the environment elicits different kinds of psychological responses from males and females. So at the level of the ecology, there probably are very big differences mm -hmm. in how different environmental experiences or life circumstances uh, evoke biological responses from males and females. And I think you know, much of that potentially structured by the kinds of bonds that you're talking about and the you know, fairly well uh, articulated set of um, sort of asymmetries coming out of the world of evolutionary theory and parental investment dynamics and things like that. So I think that, that this notion that there are sex differences in genomic responses is true, but I think most of that comes from differences in how your psychology, basically differences at the psychological level that then play out relatively similarly in males and females once you've got that. Thank you very much, Steve. We're gonna take, as usual, Jim as the last word. <laughs> Nobody has mentioned MDMA. We talk about uh, you know, the nurturing or bonding hormone, but I think there's substantial evidence that uh, MDA, MDMA has some profound effects on at least uh, connecting people. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? You, I don't know if you know the literature on this, Jim, but um, the groups in Australia have worked on MDMA in both animal models and humans. It does indeed release oxytocin. It releases vasopressin, and it burns out. Okay, so as a way to release that the hormone oxytocin, it's far from a simple treatment. It does have some of these behavioral effects are reported. But people actually stop using it on their own, apparently, after a few times. It, it loses its effects, but it also probably does some fairly serious damage so, to the brain. And I, I have to be honest, I've not personally taken this drug, at least not that I'm aware of. But uh, I've talked to people who say w the experiences that they have had on this drug have been the most profound in terms of intimacy relationships that have been very long-lived. And I, I just find that interesting. I, 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 oh. I just want to finish by saying that, that there, there is a lot of dispute as to uh, mechanisms for, for uh, readily dealing with the toxicity from oxytocin. And, and in fact, a lot of the original, or from um, MDMA, excuse me. And, and many of the original uh, research that came out, we now know, may have been, uh, have been slightly well, flawed. But, but I, I, think, I think that it's a nuanced question. It's worth asking folks like Brian Knudsen, who's in the audience, who's done some research on this and others about what, what, if there are safe ways of doing these kinds uh, of, of treatments and what, what is actually happening, at least in terms of the literature, what's actually happening, because yeah. I think it's... Well, we've measured it in controlled studies done by, um, his last name is B-A-G-G-O-T-T, -T, Matt Baggett. Baggett, some yeah. You, some of you know. And he didn't publish his version because a Dutch version came out just after we finished the study. It was, there was a profound doubling of oxytocin in blood. But again, you, you pay a price. You release all that endogenous hormone. We don't know so, anything about what it's doing in the long term. That's true. I, I would argue that there are individuals in this room fully capable of inducing extraordinary states of ecstasy in almost all of us. So <laughs> that, I'm going to close what for us has been an extraordinary <laughs> panel. So give them all a hand. <laughs>